Ashley Rock Green, Nora Roberts book, Rising Tides, it's the second book in the Chesapeake Bay series, Prologue, Ethan climbed out of his dreams and rolled out of bed, it was still dark, but he habitually started his day before night yielded to dawn, it suited him, the quiet, the simple routine, the hard work that would follow. He'd never forgotten to be grateful that he'd been able to make this choice and have this life. Though the people responsible for giving him birth, both the choice and the life were dead. For Ethan, the pretty house on the water so echoed with their voices. He would often find himself glancing up from his lone breakfast in the kitchen, expecting to see his mother shuffle in, yawning, her red hair wild tangled from sleep, her eyes half blind with it. And though she'd been gone nearly seven years, there was a comfort in that homey morning image. It was more painful to think of the man who had become his father. Ray McQuinn's death was still too fresh, after a mere three months, for there to be comfort. And the circumstances surrounding it were both ugly and unexplained. His death had come in a single car accident in broad daylight on a dry road on a March day that had only hinted of spring. The car was traveling fast, with its driver unable or unwilling to control it on a curve. Tests have proven that there had been no physical reason for Ray to crash into the telephone pole, but there was evidence of an emotional reason that they lay heavy on Ethan's heart. And that lay heavy on Ethan's heart. Ethan thought of it as he readied, readied himself for the day, given his hair still given his hair still damp from the shower, a cursory swipe with his comb, which did nothing to tame the thick waves or of sun bleached brown, shaved in the foggy mirror, his quiet blue eyes somber as he scraped lather in a night's worth of beard from a tan, bony face that held secrets he rarely chose to share. There was a scar that rode along the left of his jawline, Curtis even his oldest brother, and patiently stitched up by his mother. It had been fortunate, Ethan thought, as he rubbed the thumb absently over the fading line, that their mother had been a doctor. One of her three sons was usually in need of first aid. Ray and Stella had taken them in, three half-grown boys, all wild, all damaged, all strangers, he had made them a family. Then months before his death, Ray had taken in another. Set the Lochner belonged to them now. Ethan never questioned it. Others did, he knew. There was talk and buzz through the little town of St. Christopher's that Seth was not just another Ray Quinn Strays, but his illegitimate son. A child conceived with another woman while his wife was still alive, a younger woman. Ethan could ignore the talk, but it was impossible to ignore the fact that ten-year-old Seth looked at you with Ray Quinn's eyes. There were shadows in those eyes that Ethan also recognized. The wounded recognized the wounded. He knew that Seth's life before Ray had taken him on had been a nightmare. He lived through one himself. The kid was safe now. Ethan thought as he pulled on baggy cotton pants and a faded work shirt. He was a Quinn now. Even if the legal seas hadn't been completed, were completely worked out. They had Philip to deal with that. Ethan figured his detail mad brother would handle that end of things with the lawyer. And he knew that Cameron, the eldest of the Quinn boys, had managed to form a tedious bond with Seth. Fumbled his way to him. Ethan thought with a half mile. It had been like watching two angry tomcats spit and claw. Now they came and married the pretty social worker. Things might just settle down some. Ethan preferred a settled life. They had battles yet with the insurance company refusing on a raise policy because there was suspicions of suicide. Ethan's stomach clenched, and he took a moment to will himself relax again. His father would never have killed himself. The mighty Quinn had always faced his problems and had taught his sons to do the same. But it was a cloud over the family that refused to blow away. There was others, too. The son of parents in St. Christopher's of Seth's mother and her accusations of sexual molestation that made made to the dean of the college where Ray had taught English literature. That hadn't held. There had been too many lies, too many shifts in her story. But there was no denying that his father had been shaken. There was no denying that shortly after Gloria and Lautner left St. Christopher's again, Ray had gone away, too, and he returned with the boy. Then there was a letter found in the car after Ray's accident, an obvious blackmail threat from the Lautner woman. There was the fact that Ray had given her money, a great deal of money. Now she had disappeared again. Ethan wanted her to stay gone, but he knew the talk wouldn't stop until all the answers were clear. Nothing he could do about it, Ethan reminded himself. He stepped down into the hall, gave it a quick knock on the door opposite his. Seth Grom was followed by a sleepy mutter, then an annoyed curse. Ethan kept going, heading, kept going. 
and heading downstairs. He had no doubt that Seth would bitch again about getting up so early. We came in Anna and Italy in their honeymoon and Philip in Baltimore until the weekend. Ethan's job to get the boy up to get him headed over to a friend's house to stay until it's time to leave for school. Crabbing season was full and swing, and Waterman's day started before the sun, so until it came and Anno returned, so did Sess. The house was silent and dark, but he moved through it easily. He had a house of his own now, but part of the deal was gaining guardianship of Seth had been for the three brothers to live under the same roof and share responsibilities. Ethan didn't mind responsibilities, but he missed his little house, his privacy, and the ease of what had been his life. He flicked on the lights in the kitchen. It had been Seth's turn to clean up up after dinner the evening before and Ethan noted that he'd done a half-assed job ignoring the clutter and the sticky surface of the table. He moved directly to the stove. Simon, his dog, stretched lazily out of his grill. His tail thumped on the floor. He even set the coffee brewer greeting the receiver with an absent scratch on the head. The dream was coming back to him now. The one he'd been caught in just before waking. He and his father were out on the work boat checking crab pots just the two of them. The sun had been blinding, bright and hot. The water mirror clear and still. It's been so vivid, he thought now, even the smells of water and fish and sweat. His father's voice, so well remembered, had carried over the sounds of engine and gulls. I knew you'd look after Seth, the three of you. He didn't have to die to test that out. There was resentment in Ethan's tone, an underlying anger. He had allowed himself to admit while we... It wasn't... What I had in mind either, he said lightly, curling crabs from the pot under the float that Ethan had gafted, thick orange fisherman's gloves glowing in the sun. You can trust me on that. You got some good steamers here, and plenty of sooks. Ethan glanced at the wire pot full of crabs, automatically noting size and number, but it wasn't the catch that mattered, not here, not now. You want me to trust you, but you don't explain. Ray glanced back, tipped up the bright red cap he wore over his dramatic silver mane. The wind tugged at his hair, teasing the cart cold of John Stanback, gracing his loose t-shirt into a ripple over his broad chest. The great American rider held a sign claiming he could, he would work for food, but he didn't look too happy about it. In contrast, Ray Quinn glowered with health and energy. Rudy cheeks where deep caresses only seemed to celebrate a full in content mood of a vigorous man in his sixties with years yet to live. You gotta find your own way, your own answers. Ray smiled at Ethan out of a brilliant blue eyes, and Ethan could see the grass deep around him. It means more that way. I'm proud of you. Ethan felt a throat burn, his heart squeezed. Routinely, he rebated the pot, then watched the orange floats bobbing water. For what? For Ben. For just Ben Ethan. I should have come around more. I should have left. I shouldn't have left you alone so much. That's a crock. Now Ray's voice was more both irritated and impatient. I wasn't some old invalid. It's going to piss me off if you think that way. Blame yourself for not looking after me. For Christ's sake. Same way you wanted to blame Cam for going off to live in Europe. And even Philip if he goes off to Baltimore. Healthy birds leave the nest. Your mother and I raised healthy birds. Before he could speak, Ray raised a hand. Such a typical gesture. The professor making a point and refusing an interruption. And he said, had to smile. You missed them. That's why you wanted me want to be mad at them. They left your state and you missed having them around. Well, you've got them back now, don't you? Looks that way. And you've got yourself a pretty sister in law the begins of a boot building business and this Ray gesture take in the water. Bob and floats the tall, glossary wet eagles on the verge where a lone ear gets stood like a marble boot. And inside you've got something that Seth needs. Patience. Maybe too much of it in some areas. What's that supposed to mean? Ray sighed guzzling. There's something you don't have, Ethan, that you need. You've been waiting around and making excuses to yourself and doing not a damn thing to get it. You don't make a move soon, you're going to lose it again. <laughs> what? Ethan shrugged and maneuvered the boat to the next float. I've got everything I need and, I won't. and what I want. <laughs> don't ask yourself what. Ask yourself who. Ray Chuck clucked his tongue and gave his son a quick shoulder shake. Wake up, Ethan. Then he had waking, with the old sensation of that big familiar hand on his shoulder. But he thought, as he brooded over his first cup of coffee, he still still didn't have the answers in the prologue.